Self-Catering by Helen Grant Of course, it's no use Watson complaining. It was all his fault in the first place. He was the one who told me I needed a holiday. I can remember it quite clearly. It was a grey, wet Friday afternoon in March, and I was sitting in that cubby hole of an office of mine, going through a stack of invoices and sipping Margot's foul instant coffee out of a mug with a chip in it. Watson gave one of those irritatingly jaunty little double knocks on the door and came waltzing in without waiting for me to reply. As usual, he was dressed a bit too flashily for Lord and Son. He wore a double-breasted suit with a red silk handkerchief sticking out of the front pocket, and he had that jovial, self-satisfied look on his well-fed face. "'What are you up to, then, Larkin?' he said, without any introduction, and then he followed it up, as I knew he would, with that infuriating quip. "'Still larking around, eh? Get it, eh? Larking around? Get it, eh? Eh?' Eh? I did my best to ignore him, but it didn't work. It never did. Watson had the hide of a rhinoceros. He came and perched on the corner of my desk and made a show of craning over to see what top-secret thing I was working on. When I didn't respond, he played his trump card. He said, You're looking a bit peaky, Larkin. You want to watch it, old son, or one day you'll turn your toes up at that desk of yours. You should get out more. Well, he'd got me on my weak spot there. In those days, I used to suffer a lot with my asthma, and immediately I started wondering if I'd been overdoing it. Was I really looking that bad? Watson saw my expression and pressed home his advantage. You should take a holiday, he said impressively, flourishing a plump finger with an enormous signet ring at me. You don't need to tell me that, I said stiffly, and then I followed it up, I don't know why, with, I I'm going to book one this weekend, as a matter of fact. Watson laughed that infuriating laugh of his. That's so, he said. I'll have to come round on Monday, then, and you can tell me all about it. I doubt you'd be interested, I replied as coldly as I could. Our tastes are not the same. Ho, ho, he laughed in that revoltingly hearty way. Well, I'll see you on Monday, then. He got off my desk with all the elegance of a water buffalo. Keep larking around, was his parting shot before he took himself and his red silk handkerchief off somewhere else. The trouble with people like Watson is that they do that. They force you into a corner. They goad you and goad you until you make some silly remark. Then you've committed yourself, and you can't go back on it without making yourself look stupid. Of course, I hadn't thought of taking a holiday before then, but now I had to book one before Monday. And then I couldn't help worrying a bit about what Watson had said. Did I really look peaky. Perhaps I did need a holiday. At any rate, the next morning saw me up bright and early, walking down the high street looking for a travel agent. I'd never particularly looked for one before. I don't usually go on an organised holiday. I just spend a couple of weeks with my sister in Bournemouth. So this was a bit of a voyage of discovery, as you might say. The first one I went into was no good at all. It was one of those chains, and it was all Ibiza this and Tenerife that. Not at all suitable for a person of mature years and sober habits. I asked the girl on the desk if they did Swan Hellenic, and she stopped chewing her gum just long enough to say, Where's that, then? After that, I found myself out in the street again, with no further ideas. I wandered about a bit, but didn't see anywhere else I could try, and, frankly, I was starting to worry about what Watson had said again. Perhaps all this walking around was stressing my body, too. I decided that the best course of action would be to find a cafe and have a cup of tea and a bun whilst I plotted my next move. And that was how I found the place. I passed a side street with a little sign at the end of it reading Jane's Coffee Shop. I went down the street, but I never got as far as Jane's because the first thing I came to was a travel agent. I could see at once that this was a whole different kettle of fish from the last place. For starters, it didn't have that nasty, flashy look the other agents had. There were no fluorescent yellow posters with special offer plastered all over them in the window. It looked neat and quiet and, well, staid. It looked like a place for gentlemen travellers, not teenage tourists. And secondly, the name painted over the quaint wooden door was a genuinely exotic one. Cornelius von Teufel, travel specialist, it read. He couldn't get more foreign than that. He was sure to be an expert on all things continental. I pushed open the wooden door and went inside. 
The door opening struck a little bell which jangled as I went into the shop. It was a nice old-fashioned touch, I thought. And almost as soon as the bell rang, a man wafted out from the back of the shop somewhere. His tread was so noiseless he might have been on casters. He was about sixty, I should say, and dressed in an immaculate dark grey suit with a white shirt and a very sober dark tie. The only adornment was a little gold tie pin with some sort of funny little symbol on it. It created a very refined effect, as did his neat little beard trimmed to a point. His hair was receding, revealing a high domed forehead, but he had resisted the temptation to comb it over the bald patch. His eyes twinkled behind little steel-rimmed glasses. Cornelius von Teufel, he said, in a soft and very slightly accented voice. He held out a perfectly manicured hand. How may I help you? Uh, Edward Larkin, pleased to meet you, I said, shaking his hand. I'd like to book a holiday. He made me a little bow. Really, his manners were perfectly gentlemanly, and I congratulated myself on finding the shop. It was a cut above the other place, that was for certain. You are, of course, aware that we specialise, von Teufel inquired. Well, I replied as grandly as I could, I am looking for something, shall we say, exclusive. Then I added, what sort of thing do you specialise in? A spiritual journeys, he announced. His eyes sparkled behind the little glasses, and for a moment he became much more animated, carried away, no doubt, by enthusiasm for the job. Spiritual journeys, I repeated, a bit doubtfully. I had visions of a week in a monastic retreat, or a course on art history, neither of which appealed. If I wanted boredom, I could get it at any day of the week at Lauder's. Yes, he said, positively gushing with enthusiasm, for the truly sensitive, the truly open-minded individual, we offer a range of unique supernatural experiences. Supernatural? I gaped at him for a moment before I remembered to shut my mouth. Oh, yes, he went on. For those who have ever wondered whether there is really anything out there, whether life continues after we have shuffled off this mortal coil, or for those who simply wish to experience the ultimate frisson that only comes from a close encounter with the world beyond, von Teufel travel offers a unique opportunity to find out. And he went on a bit more like that while I digested what he just said. Of course, it had to be a gimmick, though it was a new one, I'd give him that, Furthermore, he'd got himself a good audience this time. Not a lot of people know this, not even my sister, bless her. But I'm quite an avid reader of what they call genre fiction in my spare time. Call it my private vice, if you like. Where other fellows like to peruse the sports pages of the Telegraph, or even read rags like Playboy, like Watson, for example, I shouldn't wonder, well, I like to curl up with a good horror novel. It takes me out of myself, as they say. So one way and another I quite enjoyed Cornelius von Teufel's little performance, and of course I decided to enter into the spirit of it. Well, let me see what you can offer, I said gamely. Ah, a true connoisseur, he beamed. Step this way, if you would, please. We went towards the back of the shop, where there was a little area that looked more like a gentleman's club than anything, all green leather chairs, sporting prints on the walls, and an expensive-looking Persian rug. I sat in one of the chairs, and he fussed around, gathering papers together. Eventually, he sat in a chair opposite me, and perused the uppermost sheet over the top of his spectacles. "'Many of our clients enjoy the more traditional trips,' he began. "'I can offer you the Bram Stoker Special, which comprises a five-day tour of Transylvania, including Castle Dracula, and ends up with a visit to the Lair of the White Worm, very popular, especially with vermologists.' I shuddered. Not really my cup of tea. Alternatively, he went on, undaunted, we can offer music lovers the chance to experience the beautiful city of Paris with the Gaston Leroux Phantom Deluxe. Music lovers, I repeated, visions of the Moulin Rouge rising enticingly before my eyes. Opera, of course, he remarked in his quiet voice. Opera, fat women with hordes of chins screeching away in Viking helmets? Hastily, I held up my hand. Uh, no, thank you. Not, I continued, seeing one of those neat eyebrows rising slightly, that I have anything against culture. Then perhaps you would enjoy our Haywain trip, suggested von Teufel. An opportunity to literally step into the mind of the artist. Haywain, I said, isn't that by constable, or with the horses and the river? Pardon me for saying so, but I don't see anything particularly 
supernatural about that. Ah, yes, a number of people have made that assumption, he said. The name actually refers to the Hay Wayne by Hieronymus Bosch. He fell silent for a moment, reflecting. I rather think we must change the name of that particular trip. There have been complaints. I recall one elderly gentleman explicitly objected to the impaling. Some people have, I fear, very little appreciation for medieval symbolism. Look here, I said. I'm sure impaling and gigantic worms are all very well in their place, but I'm really looking for something a bit more subtle. This is supposed to be a holiday, after all. Don't you have anything with just a, a suggestion of nastiness rather than going the whole hog? To give him his due, von Teufel took this on the chin. Absolutely, he said very smoothly, without any sign of offence. For those who prefer a more understated apparition, I would thoroughly recommend the M. R. James Memorial Trip to Burnstow. This sounded a lot more interesting. I sat forward. What does that involve? I asked, hopefully. First class travel to and from Burnstow, a tour of the beach and a visit to the Green Dragon, he informed me. Well, that sounds excellent, I said, starting to feel quite enthusiastic. Then a thought struck me. Hang on, I don't remember any green dragon, I said. Wasn't it the Globe Inn in the story? He had the grace to look a little ashamed. Indeed it was, Mr. Larkin, you are quite right. So what's the green dragon, then? It's a top-quality laundrette, he admitted. There is a good deal of crumpled linen, he added. It's not really the same, though, is it? I remarked. Why can't I visit the Globe instead? Alas, not possible, he said, spreading his hands in a gesture of regret. It burned to the ground some years ago. A fire in the linen cupboard, I believe. Some guests were charged, but I don't believe it came to anything. I sighed. I'm very sorry, but none of these really appeals. Is there nothing else you can offer me? Well, he replied slowly, as though debating whether to commit himself for particular very valued customers, we do offer a self-catering option. Self-catering? I said. You mean I would stay in a haunted house? Can you absolutely guarantee it would be haunted? Oh, yes, he said with enthusiasm. He looked straight at me, and I saw his eyes twinkling behind his steel-rimmed glasses. It would be a hundred percent guaranteed to be haunted. Wonderful, I said. Can you show me some properties? Of course. He arose and fetched a thick file, which he spread on an occasional table before me. We have a range of properties, including period houses, several castles, an old mill, and a lighthouse. I leaned over and peered at the pictures. What about this, I asked, Borley Rectory? I've heard of that one. Alas, fully booked for the foreseeable future, said von Teufel. But if you would prefer an ecclesiastical environment, we have a very nice vicarage in Hampshire. Well, let's take a look, I said, thinking that it would be very convenient if I wanted to run down and see my sister for the day. I perused the photograph. It was a very attractive property. Queen Anne, I think they called it, with red bricks and white windows. I see it has four bedrooms, I commented, running my eye down the information printed underneath the photo. Yes, indeed, said von Teufel quietly. He looked at me meditatively. For you, Mr. Larkin, I think I would suggest the blue bedroom. I won't bore you with a discussion about possible dates and all the rest of it. Eventually I got out my little-used credit card and paid a sizable deposit to Von Teufel Travel, then signed a contract. Of course, you will say, I should have read the small print, but Von Teufel seemed such a gentleman I felt it would be pointedly impolite to give him the third degree about the details. The only thing I did think was a bit funny at the time was that the contract was all written in red ink, but I thought perhaps that was something to do with travel regulations. Anyway, I signed with a flourish, and was just straightening up when von Teufel came up close to me with something glittering in his hand. I took it for a silver fountain pen, thinking he was going to add his own name to the contract or something. You will think me dreadfully naive, but I didn't even smell a rat when he asked me to stand up a little straighter. Obligingly, I did so, and with one wonderfully swift movement he flourished the glittering object aloft, and then plunged it into my chest. You know... They say it is remarkably difficult to stab someone in the heart, regardless of what might occur in popular fiction. The organ is well protected in its cage of ribs, and genuine stabs to the heart are usually the result of luck, rather than judgment. All I can say on this point is that Cornelius von Teufel was either very lucky, or extremely skilful in his aim. 
The side of the blade scraped a little against one rib, I'll grant you that, but otherwise his aim was true, and the knife slid into my heart and punctured it like a balloon. It's a very curious experience, I can tell you, to feel one's heart skewered, like a piece of barbecued meat. Instantly I felt the front of my shirt grow hot and wet, but after that I felt very little, for the room was growing dim and faint around me. I could feel my heart making one last sad attempt to beat, and the blood came pumping out over my hands and pattered down onto my shoes. I tottered on my feet, and Cornelius von Teufel laid a steadying hand on my shoulder. At last I drifted away into blackness. I heard his soft voice say, Bon voyage. That puzzled me a bit. I could have sworn he was German. So here I am, in the blue room, on what you might call an extended holiday. At any rate, I've plenty of spare time, and my asthma no longer bothers me. No lungs, you see. The vicarage isn't inhabited by the living just at present, but I'm not lonely. I have company. One of the things that you may not know, if you've not yet crossed the Great Divide, is that the recently deceased do have a certain amount of influence, especially those who've died a violent death. It's comparatively short-lived, which is why so many apparitions have to vent their wrath through groaning and clanking and other ineffectual activities. But for a short time the influence is relatively powerful. In death I like to think I demonstrated a little more drive than I ever did in life, working at Lauders. What I did was this. I encouraged Watson to take a holiday too. I think he should be grateful, really. Actual death couldn't possibly be any worse than working at Lauders for another thirty years. But all the same, he never stops complaining. The trouble with Watson is that he's terribly vain, and there's no doubt his looks have changed a little. And not for the better. Cornelius von Teufel stabbed him twice, you see, through the eyes. And it's hard to look debonair if your eyes look like two overcooked tomatoes that someone has punctured with a kebab skewer. Still, he's stuck with them now, and as I said at the beginning, he's only himself to blame. 